Hi everyone, welcome to episode 124. Um, welcome, welcome to the show, welcome to new and returning viewers. Thank you so much for being here. I'm just gonna turn my, tilt my camera because otherwise I look at the monitor and not at you guys. Um, I hope you're doing really well. This is Saturday morning. It is August, um, September 7th. I'm still getting used to saying September. Um, we've had a crazy week here. Mike had uh, major eye surgery and so and the kids were also back to school. So there's so a lot's going on, a lot of curveballs. Um, but Mike's doing really well and um, we were able to eke out one more live stream. I had to move the time slightly. So thank you so much to those who are here and were able to accommodate a very small time change in the stream because uh, we actually have a follow-up for him this morning so we just need to um, I didn't want to move the date or the time again like too much we sort of wanted to try to keep it somewhat stable so I'm really glad that you guys are able to be here so good morning to Carly and Charlotte and Karma and Kelly and San and Natalie and Eve thank you so much for being here you guys there's tons of other people in the chat but um, I it's scrolling past a bit too quickly for me to see. Um, today on today's show we have a little bit of breed and color studies. This is probably our last, if not our second to last, um, breed and color study discussion because we are nearing the end of this particular breed and color study. We're going to be finished at the end of the month. Please continue to post your photos. Please continue to post your projects. I know there are lots out there who haven't even started, so please uh, just you know, continue to post and to share your stuff. There's a dedicated thread in the Ravelry group. I think I've linked it in the show notes, but if I haven't, I will add it. I don't think I, no, I haven't. So I will link it, but it's the ongoing finished objects thread. So for any breed and color study that we've done in the past, so we're up to like something like six studies now or something. I think we've even done a few more and you can just post your ongoing projects. So if you finished your spin for that was the fin from last year and you just finished it, you can post your photos in there. No chatter if you don't mind so that people can scroll through and just see projects and get inspiration and ideas as well. I can scroll through and see inspiration and, and get ideas. And if I have sponsors for the show or anything, it means that I can draw from a few different places around where we could do the giveaway, so that could be one of the places. Um, so we've got breeding color studies. I've got a couple of works in progress to share with you, something that got a little bit waylaid um, that I wanted to just talk about really quickly. I have a finished, a completely finished, finished, finished item, and that will take us to the end of the show. So let's just get right into it. So breed and color studies. I've got a couple of people, a few people actually, to highlight this morning, which is really exciting. And I, I'm i looking forward to highlighting these people because they've shared in the Ravelry group and in the thread and whatnot, and I wasn't able to kind of get in there and um, feature these ones. And so, because I think it was last show we ended up not doing any projects from the Ravelry group or from the um, Patreon group. So it was just really great to be able to do that this show. I had a little bit of time to sit down this week in, in amongst the craziness and prepare for the show. And it was just nice scrolling through the threads and seeing what people have shared and reading through what people have shared. So let's talk about, I think Tessa's photo is going to cycle through. So we'll read sort of in order of how these come up. So this is the old shale. Uh, Donna who is DLB knit on Ravelry. She shares her shawl. It's a variation on an old lace pattern, old shale. Um, it was, she said in the uh, Ravelry group that it was a Multnomah hack, which the Multnomah is a pattern that was written by Kate Ray. And she used to host a podcast, but I don't think she's hosting it anymore. And I actually can't remember what the name of it was, even though I did watch it. Um, and that was, it's a pattern on Ravelry. I'm not actually sure if it's 
free or not. So, but I know I have it and I, I have made it in my hand spun. So it was neat to see Donna do that. This is Tessa's project and I'm going to read what she wrote. I haven't had a chance to knit up my yarn yet, but here it is. For the study, I chose Katrina's undyed braid rather than the dyed fiber, in part because I've had such great access to her dyed fibers before and wanted to make sure others got their chance to enjoy how awesome it is, and also because I had an idea to try something myself. Tessa lives locally to me and Katrina, so we always see her at uh, Fibers West in Knit City. And shout out to Tessa, hello. I hand carded the dyed fiber, oh wait, I managed a bit of natural sun dyeing, she put in quotes, with tea, coffee, and turmeric. I hand carded the dyed fiber to make it a woolen prep, and since it really felt like it wanted to be spun long draw and turned into a proper woolen yarn. I'm still a long draw novice, and this was a very manageable fiber and a nice size project to practice with. What I really appreciated about this study was that a lot of people in the Ravelry group shared that they weren't super comfortable with long draw and that because of the fiber and choosing dorset horn for this study they were able to practice and try that which I thought was really great because that was oh morning Tessa she's in the chat um because that meant that people were pushing themselves out of their comfort zone and were really trying new things which is just awesome I noticed I know the color will fade with time because of the dyes and the method, and I'm okay with that. It was a fun experiment. I found this fiber really took the dyes well, especially given the very simple prep. I ended up with a total of about 205 yards of beautifully springy worsted weight wool yarn, woolen, woolen yarn. Sorry, that's my fault. I'm reading wrong. I hope to spin more dorset horn in the future. I really enjoyed it. That's one of the things that I actually really appreciate about this study. Dorset's always been one of my favorites. And you guys know that I wax poetic about the downs on the show all the time. And I think this was a study that Katrina and I felt like we really kind of went on a limb doing a fiber like dorset only because a lot of these fibers are considered too coarse and too toothy, which is totally fine. Sorry, everybody. My family's leaving. Um, Mike's taking them out for a bit. And... So they're walking by and I had to wave. They get a sort of a bad reputation a little bit. And um, I think people really overlook them. And I think one of the things about the study that really reinforced our choice this time around for me and Katrina, we've talked about it, her and I, is the fact that we, everybody came back and said how much they enjoyed this fiber and how much they enjoyed spinning this fiber. With the Massim, there were a couple of people that came back to us and said, you know what, I'm allergic to it. I couldn't spin it and I had to sell it. Or uh, that was one person's experience. Another person came back and said, that was really toothy and I'm not sure what to do with it, but I'm glad that I had the opportunity to spin it and work with it, but I think I'm going to pass the actual yarn along. But with this one, I feel like a fiber that is very much overlooked got put in the spotlight and we all sort of ended up really appreciating it, which is great. So well done, Tessa. Really cool. I'm excited to see it. I would love to see this in like a toque or some mitts. I bet it would be uh, really quite lovely. All right. The last one that we had is from Savannah, uh, who's savvy like that on Ravelry. And I'm just going to wait till the photos cycle through because this is um, Donna's, Donna's Multnomah Old Shale Feather and Fan. It's a Feather and Fan modification. Um... And if you're interested in learning more about that that stitch pattern and the difference between old shell and feather and fan, there's some there's an article that was linked in the Ravelry group about it. So this is Savannah's project. I dyed 100 grams of a colorway with peaches and purples, and 50 grams I left white, and 50 grams I dyed black. I then split the 100 gram colorway into two 50 gram into two 50 gram bunches, and one went with the white and one went with the black. I then made roll eggs with the blended fiber. The colorway, the white plus the colorway was 100 grams, which I split into two 50 gram lots of roll eggs, and the black plus the colorway was 100 grams, and she did the same thing. So she basically had four bundles of the white carded with the colorway and the black colorway carded with the colorway. One white plus the colorways was spun and plot and chain plied. One was spun and two plied, and then she did the same with the black. So she basically had 50 grams of each, and she had one two two ply sample and one chain plied sample of each colorway. So you can see the four skeins there. Two of them, uh, the one on this right here and the third one in, those are the two plied samples. 
One was with white, one was with black. I then wove it on my sample it with a one and a half meter warp, 14 warp ends per skein, so 14 ends per inch, and in the order of black chain ply, white two ply, black two ply, white chain ply across the warp. And I kept the same order as the weft, repeating up the piece, which I think is really cool that she did that and that she didn't just weave. I thought that was really neat that she actually took the time to figure out how to keep it the same warp and weft. It was fascinating to see how the color managed. I didn't expect it to puff up as much as it did, so even though it was my thinnest singles, it's the thickest, it's a thick enough yarn, DK to worsted almost. And she's actually made a YouTube video about her process and how she went through it, and I've linked it down below in the show notes. So if you check patreon.com slash pearls and click on episode 124, the link is there, or you can go to the blog, wellforpearls.com, click on episode 124, and it is there. The links to both are down below in the YouTube chitter chatter down here. So yeah, really cool. Thank you, you guys, so much for sharing, and thank you for posting your photos and for uh, you know taking the time to share what you did in the Ravelry group, because some people have been sharing in both the Ravelry group and on the Slack channel, and then some people have only been sharing in the Ravelry group. And it's just really great to see that people are taking the time and that they've written down what they did. I just, I really appreciate that. I love this shawl. It's just beautiful. Really well done, Donna. So. All right. I'm going to shift the cameras and we're going to talk about some works in progress. So as you can see, I have sitting here my, oh, and I lost my chat. So just hang on. I'm going to talk to Mike because every time I switch the cameras around on OBS, the pop-up chat, I lose it, and I just, it's annoying for one thing, but I want to make sure, I'm just making sure that everything's running over on Patreon, but you guys are all here, so I'm assuming everything's fine. I like to check at least once just to make sure that things are okay. All right, um, so I have to always click back to make sure my pop-up chat comes back because it disappears into the ether. But I want to talk to Mike about pinning it to the top so that even though I'm clicking and doing stuff down below that the pop-up chat doesn't move. All right. Yeah, you're right, Eve. The turmeric dyed um, is really vibrant. I'm, I, I was surprised how vibrant it was. Yeah. We use so much turmeric in our house that I... Um, turmeric and cinnamon. We go through a ton of it. And because I put it in... I put a quarter teaspoon of each into everything for all of us once a day. There's some health benefits and stuff. And uh, I was like, do I really want to use my turmeric for dying? Because we eat so much of it. <laughs> do I want to waste it? But it's not waste because when you get that kind of color, it's just beautiful. All right. So works in progress. This is my Sparks of Grey shawl. We've talked about this shawl on previous episodes. And if you're interested in knowing a little bit more about this project and why I cast it on and sort of the history behind it, uh, please go and have a look at the previous episode, um, 123, because I talked about it quite extensively. So on the last episode, I was halfway through a row, which you can see I am still halfway through a row, but I was able to spend a few minutes before the show and lay it out properly. So this is what it's looking like thus far. And the hand spun is spin cycle mill ends. So you know how, I don't know if some of you may not be uh, familiar with spin cycle, but I'll just put this here for just a minute. Spin cycle is a yarn company. It's an indie dye, dyeing yarn company for lack of a better way of describing them. It's two girls, Rachel and Kate, and they um, basically dye fiber and they used to when they first started, excuse me, they would actually do all of the yarns themselves and spin them all hand spun and they just couldn't keep up with the demand. So they started dyeing the fiber and then they send it to a mill to be processed and then they, and then they, their yarns look like hand spun. Um, so every skein of their yarn is ever so slightly different. But when they were here one year at Knit City, back in, I think it was 2000 and, oh shoot. I had said on the podcast when it was, 2014. They were here at Knit City that year in October and they had a whole bunch of bags of their 
mill end, so the fiber that doesn't end up getting spun, that's at the en- that's at the end of the cones and stuff when it's spun. And they were selling them and they were cheap, cheap, cheap. Anyways, this one is pick your poison. And so I spun it up. So it doesn't look exactly like it would if I bought a skein of this yarn from them that was the pick your poison colorway. But it's three ply. It's a heavy fingering. I spun it in 2014 during Spinzilla. And the colors are really the same. And I saw the colorway in my local yarn shop one day and I picked it up and I was like, oh yeah, that looks very similar. Um, so it's been kind of neat to work with their colors without buying their yarn because I got to work with their fiber. So, um, it was really nicely done. Um, the mill ends like the actual fiber itself. It was really beautifully, beautifully prepped. Uh, and it spun like a dream, even though you're sort of dealing with these bits and pieces of fiber. I bought a second one of their colorways and I think it's spotty dog or something like that. I think it's one of their discontinued colorways now. Anyhow, I've been kind of coveting it and I really should spin it. But when I do, I'll show you guys what the mill ends look like because they don't look like actual fiber that we would be used to spinning. And yet they did come from like combed top prep. So it's kind of interesting. Anyhow, these are the colors and how it's working up. I'm really loving it. But I've been using the the, com- the commercial yarn that's the contrast is, cr- I, I guess it's cream. It looks white in real life. And I had a whole bunch of these skeins in my stash. So these are them here. And um, I thought that I had bought them all at the same time or roughly the same time. And I I think what's ended up happening is I've ended up with like these random little skeins of like four ply baby sweater kind of white yarn. One of them is, um, it's... Well, actually, I, I, my aunt used to work with this for baby knits in England. So, and then another sand nesgarn. I can never, I never know how they actually say that. Anyways, so I started, I attached this one thinking it was the same color because it looks the same, right? It looks the same. Yeah, it's not. This is white. This is cream. So, I ended up with a whole section up here. I had knit probably a good inch. I'd gone through the repeat, the the stitch repeat, the stitch pattern, the full eight rows. And I was looking at it. We were sitting outside in the natural light and me and the cul-de-sac girls were sitting there. We're chit-chatting, we're chit-chatting. And one of the 14-year-old, she actually just turned 15, daughters walked up. And she's like, oh, that is so pretty. Can I see it? And I said, oh, yeah, totally. And so I, I, I was at the end of a row. And so I spread it out and I showed her. And I laid it out like on my lap, like fully out because I wasn't in the middle of a row. And I saw it was, there was a stripe. So this is cream and these are all white. None of them match. None of them work. So much for stash busting. So this project is kind of getting gotten waylaid and I've tried to get to the yarn shop every single day this week and um, just with everything going on I haven't been able to but I am a bit worried that I'm not going to be able to find a yarn that matches and I couldn't just leave it. It was a stark line. The one yarn is white and this yarn is cream and it was like it was obvious because the other, the, my, my girlfriends were like, oh, it's not that noticeable. Like just leave it, blah, blah, blah. But the thing is, I know that once that shawl is finished, there's going to be a stark contrast and a, and a big difference between the two. So that was kind of a bummer. So I'm just hoping that I can get yarn that matches a bit more closely. Cause the thing is when you put these yarns next to this yarn like this, they look the same. So I'm just hoping I can find a yarn that matches closely enough because now I'm actually a bit concerned. So we'll see. So fingers crossed I can find the right yarn. I thought worst case scenario, Katrina's Tough and Tender, uh, which is her superwash Targi, I think it's Targi Nylon base in the natural is cream and that would probably be a close enough match. So I was going to ask her if she had like a mini skein that I could have and I could just attach it and knit a little bit and see if it's close enough. So yeah, all these, you know, things like this happen though. Like when you're working on big projects like this and you're stash busting and you've had stuff in your stash for a long time and you start something and you don't pay that close attention to what you're working with. And like this, this yarn 
that I used for this. It didn't have a label on it anymore. So I didn't really know what it was. I wasn't really sure where it was from. I knew that I didn't have enough, but I had all of these, so I didn't think anything of it. And in hindsight, if I had known, I would have just striped them. So every two rows that were the cream slash white, I would have interchanged them and then it wouldn't have been noticeable. But it's still a bummer. You know, right here, like these are each $6. So it's $18 plus tax of yarn sitting here and I wanted to be able to use it up, you know. But yeah, it's just a bummer. All right. The next project that I have in the work. Oh, you guys have been so chatty. Okay, hang on. Let me Let me just catch up. Um, oh, welcome Kelly. Hi, good to see you. Hi, Rebecca. I saw, um, baby's, uh, um, additions to the chat. That was quite cute. Um, yeah, super frustrating. Yeah, you're right, Diane. Uh, the light plays differently on the surface of the skein yarn versus the knit yarn. Yeah, it's so true. You think that you've got the same colors and you think you've got the same stuff and then you start knitting with it and it completely changes the yarn. Yeah, the problem is I don't have any of the cream left. So Rebecca said you could still do the striping thing if you can't find the matching yarn. I still need a cream to do the striping though. So I'm actually, you know what I'm wondering? I, I was actually thinking before I go to the yarn shop later today or to, she's closed tomorrow on Monday, I might actually toss my stash and see if I can find any more of that yarn and just find all of those skeins or balls of yarn that I can find. And maybe I'll find one that more closely matches because I could have sworn that it was the Lanet and then they knit up so differently. So it makes me wonder. So we have talked on the podcast before about the sweater Shifty. Uh, it's by Andrea Maori. It's a pullover. It's a cropped sweater. A lot of people have, well, not a lot. There's quite a number of people who have modified it to be a cardigan which was kind of my plan. And actually, if you guys don't mind me just taking a moment, I will show you. Um, the Shifty is a really neat pattern because it's it's knit in spin cycle yarn. So it gives people a really good idea of what a sweater might look like if it's knit in hand spun. Because I think, I think sometimes hand spun gets a little bit of a bad reputation because you've got all this natural striping that happens in hand spun because of how comb top is dyed. And I think it ends up being a little bit intimidating for many of us in terms of how to knit it up and what to use it in. And so this is the sweater here. Had somebody give me the feedback that showing it here is it's not big enough. So thank you for that because I didn't realize. So this is the shifty. The colors aren't coming up exactly on the webcam because it just doesn't pick up all the nuances that a proper camera does. Well, not that a webcam is on a proper camera, but you know what I mean. Anyways, that's the shifty. And it's based on the pattern, the shift cowl and the night shift, which is a big shawl pattern that Andrea has developed. So this was kind of the third in that series of patterns. But what a lot of people have done with it that I think is really neat is they've cardiganized it. So I want to show you that just so you can kind of get an idea. I did show it on the pat on the show before. Yeah, I'd still have to rip it back. That's right, Rebecca. Um, and I really don't want to rip it back. It's just so much knitting. I would almost rather have a stripe of white in it than to rip it back. Because um, I know that what would happen is I'd rip it back and I wouldn't re-knit it. I wouldn't restart the pattern, or the, the sweater. So this is what people have done to cardiganize this, which is just wonderful. This one was knit out of Spin Cycle Yarns as well. But she used slightly different colorways from the original pattern. And that's what it looks like. She's put in seven buttons, I think, because it is a cropped cardigan. I think she lengthened it slightly. Um, I think based on when I read her notes, I feel like she lengthened it a little bit. Anyhow, I've talked about it on the podcast before and I posted in the Slack channel the colors that I'm planning on using. 
But I went through my stash to see if I could find as many fibers as I could that sort of would give me the overall look that I wanted, which is slightly gray, a little bit green. This is all part of building my capsule wardrobe that we're talking about on the wool stream, which is a new Patreon tier. And so I'm going for, I've, I've chosen the colors of my wardrobe that I wanna focus on. And most of my wardrobe is already those colors, which is perfect. And my goal right now is to half my wardrobe. So I've got like my wardrobe right now and I'm going to half it to start and then I'm going to go from there because a whole bunch of stuff doesn't fit me anyways. So this is a bump of, it's West Coast color. I can't remember if it's BFL silk. Oh, this one's Polar silk. So I have three of these that I ended up with in my stash and I bought them all at the same time and I was going to spin them and knit them into a sweater and I never did. And I bought them back in like 2014, 2013. It was quite a long time ago for me. And this is what it looks like before I stripped it. So it's got these lighter sections and it's got these darker sections, but overall it's sort of this gray green and it's got these hits of brown in here, which I think the webcam is picking up as red, but it, they're actually brown. So I've been splitting it and pre-drafting it into these nests. And I've done half, and I've done half of this, the, I think this was a hundred and, Linda's really, really, or Lynn, she's really generous with her, her, with her fiber. She doesn't braid it, she just pops it into a, well you guys have seen it on the show, I've showed you, because we've had giveaways of her fiber. Um, so this one was almost 120 grams and the other one I have is like 130 grams and then there's another one that's a partial skein that is, I think it's only like 80 grams. So then in total I ended up with about a, about 300 grams. So what I'm going to do is each one is going to be spun to a bobbin and then I'll have three bobbins of this these singles here. This is the two ply ply back test here. I just love this so much. Oh, I just, oh, I saw it and I was like, oh, I love that. It's perfect. So I'm spinning on quite a high ratio to get all that twist in there and to have such a firm ply back test. So I keep checking it and keep pulling it out of my wheel and whatnot. Um, the singles, I don't have a, um, I don't actually have a wraps print ruler right here. Unfortunately, because I can't even like grab it and sh t share. And I haven't done any of my measurements, my statistics and stuff yet. Like you can see this all blank. So I will keep you posted. But this is the first single of the first yarn for this sweater. And I thought what I would do is as I work on it and as I spin it, because this is a big project, I, I'll just share my progress and I'll share with you the different colorways that I've chosen so that you can see over time sort of how this is unfolded. I've already posted which fibers I've chosen and what the contrast colors and stuff will be in the Slack channel. Um, and then I thought as I work on this project, I'll share it with you. Cause it's gonna be sort of a long-term, very slow. I've had a lot of, I don't know if, I, I've been reflecting a lot and thinking a lot about how I want to go forward with my making because the problem is, is if I get rid of a whole bunch of my clothing and then I just start making, 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 making and not being really intentional about how I curate what I want and having, I, I'm, I'm sort of hoping that eventually I can have about 35 items and that would be like all seasons. Then when I do, when I take the time to make a garment, then it needs to be very intentional and it's probably going to take a while. So I've been thinking about that a lot because like, how do you do that? So it's going to take a long time. The, is the three, four ounce braids generally enough for a medium size? No. So it really depends, Charlotte. So I find for me, 300 grams isn't quite enough to do a full-sized cardigan for me. I find I need about a pound. So I need about 550, or sorry, between 450 and 550 
grams of fiber. With my sparkle cardigan, and that was the one that was white and it had the all over lace and it was the Romney Disdero, uh, Romney Mohair Disdero Ranch fiber. That was a pound and a half, I think. And after I had spun it all and after I knit it, it didn't take nearly the amount of yarn that I thought that it would. I think that cardigan ended up taking about between 900 and 1100 yards of yarn and the pattern called for like 1600 yards of yarn. I don't know why I took so little, but I knit the size 38 bust too. So it wasn't like I knit it with like negative ease or anything. But I find that 300 grams, even if it's spun really super finely and it's like a fine two ply or a fine three ply, I find I have to shorten the, le the length of the sleeves and I have to knit very, very open, like a very open gauge. And I can't add any length to the length of the cardigan. So I've done a couple of cropped cardigans with a smaller amount of yardage and a smaller amount of fiber, and I don't wear them. Uh, one of them was a pulver silk spin that I over dyed because it had, the dye had um, separated in the process and it was second, it was um, seconds from Sweet Georgia. And I never wear that cardigan, which is kind of a bummer because I really like it. It's just a featherweight by Hannah Fettig. But yeah, I, for me, I need more fiber. So for this, for the shifty sweater, for the shifty um, cardigan slash pullover, I, my, I'm actually, I have six braids set aside for this. So three for the main color and then three for the contrast colors because there's three contrast colors. I also fully expect to have leftovers from this project. So I was thinking that whatever leftover yarn that I have, I'll either use it up in, an, in, an, in a knitted shawl or I was thinking I would actually weave with it so but I fully expect that I'm going to have a lot <laughs> you have to be naked in between that's so funny maybe you could weed out and replace in categories that's actually what I'm going to do Diane so a lot of my clothing I've had for over 10 years most of my stuff is from university and so my plan is actually, and so some of my stuff is actually getting quite old and it doesn't actually, it doesn't fit me anymore. So I'm going to go through it, try a bunch of stuff on and uh, get rid of stuff that isn't an immediate, I love this. And then I'll be able to kind of start fresh. Some of the, like I tried, so we've, I've got my dad's memorial in two weeks from now. So it's two weeks yesterday. So I was looking through my stuff and I have this, like, it's just, this is just an example, but I have a beautiful dress that I bought at Banana Republic when Mike and I first got married. So 2007, it was early, early 2007. And we had a whole bunch of weddings to go to that summer. We were getting married. There were a bunch of events that we had. And so I spent the money and I got this really beautiful dress. Well, I tried it on the other day because I was thinking maybe I would wear that to my dad's memorial. And it fits me perfectly. It still fits beautifully. But it's not something I would buy now and it's not something I would wear now, yet it's to it's very classic. And as soon as I put it on, I felt great. And I sort of was like, the last few weddings that we've gone to and the last few events where I needed to wear something like that, I didn't even think to pull it out of my closet. And really, for that type of a dress and that type of a, because it's such a beautiful silk dress, I really don't need any other dresses. I only need that one. <laughs> so it's just being like thinking about some of that stuff and reflecting on it. So not that I have a lot of dresses. I probably have about five, but still. You guys will recognize this. This is the last work in progress that I have. Uh, this is the yarn that's hanging up behind me here. It's the Clun Forest that Katrina very kindly dyed for me in the gold finch colorway. It's a two-ply. It's worsted weight, but it's um, it's Clun Forest, so it's a down. It's very, very springy. It's very elastic. Um, this ball, when I balled it, cause I'm going to do yardage counts as, as I do, as I skate, as I ball the yarn, it was 300 yards. Like check out that elasticity. Isn't that crazy? I'll go this way so you guys can see how much my hands are moving. It's like two inches of elasticity. It's crazy. Um, so I decided to knit a very, a slightly firmer fabric than I maybe normally would. I didn't go down to four and a half millimeter needles. I thought that would be too dense, but I wanted a really hard wearing cardigan because I think this yarn could have been knit anywhere from 
four and a half up to about five and a half or maybe even six millimeter needles because if you want a really open gauzy fabric the five and a half millimeter needles would have been perfect I probably would have done five and a half if I was doing this in a shawl so I ended up choosing the the gauge that I liked the best and the fabric that I liked the best was on the five millimeter needle so this is it here and you can see how elastic it is like it's just it's just crazy so my original plan with this was to knit an Acer by Amy Christophers or, or Christophers, however you say your last name, or I was going to do the Charlie cardigan, which is an old pattern that Amy Herzog put out years ago, but it's like $13 now because of the fit to flatter stuff, uh, and her app. Um, and then I was also looking at Lady Marple, but I already did it this summer twice. I still haven't finished the second version. I showed it to you on the podcast, but I haven't done anything with it. Um, and it's here behind me. And I'm making that shirt right now that's underneath. It's just on my dress form for fitting. And I, so I, I just didn't want to do that again. So then I started thinking about the cardigans that I wear the most and thinking about this capsule wardrobe idea and blah, 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 blah. And I have really wanted to, for a long time, take the textured recipe shawl what's that pattern called the textured recipe shawl or the tech something like that anyways this is the pattern it's a free pattern I'll link to it in the show notes I think I did actually maybe I didn't no I haven't added it yet because I was going to anyhow um it, this is the pattern it's a slip stitch it's a knit one it's a slip one knit one yarn over slip pass the slip stitch over it's very very simple it's a one stitch repeat two stitch repeat sorry and just simple raglan top down I cast on 88 stitches and I actually used Laura Chow's top down raglan cardigan pattern it's a free pattern it was posted on her blog eons ago I've used it a few times for various things the only modification that I did from that and then so I got the numbers from her from her blog post and then I I didn't that was I didn't even print the pattern um, I just got the numbers for how much to cast how many stitches to cast on and then um, what I did was after I had cast on and started the raglan increases and I put this on the, my dress form and it it fits perfectly and this will stretch a bit when I wash it and it'll relax a bit and it'll just even out uh, I added short rows to the back to lift up the back so when you lay it out I've been working on this while I've been waiting to try to figure out yarn options for my sparks of gray actually I started this this week um, so I lifted up the back with four short row repeats so I put one over here on this side of the sleeve so I did one over here and then I went back did the other one over there and I went back and did one here and then I went back and did one here and then I kept going and that just it just lifts up the back so that your back neck when you add the in Laura's pattern she wants you to do the ribbing for the top of the cardigan first and then continue on but I find it doesn't give enough structure to the cardigan or to the sweater so I like to do that after and so then I didn't do that and then I added the short rows. So in her pattern, there's no short row shaping for the back neck because it's just a very simple pattern. And um, that's what I did. Kelly, you're so funny. I'm very curious about seeing this dress now. I'll show it to you. I can grab it and show it to you guys another day. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's a gorgeous dress. Um, I would absolutely buy it again now. It's just that it's really fancy, so it's and I don't work in an office, so and I never will. I'll always wear scrubs um, my, for my whole career. So it's just one of those things. It's just it's just too fancy for what I wear. Um, I wear a lot of this jeans, a t-shirt, and then a cardigan over top. So like if you put if I put on my Malbrigo cardigan right now, that one back there, this is pretty much what I look like every day all day. <laughs> I'm very consistent. Um, yeah, so. Request for Clun fi Forest Fiber for a breed. That's a great idea, Karma. I will talk to I will talk to Katrina. That's a great idea. I love Clun Forest. So my friend Kelsey dropped by 
earlier this week. I haven't seen her all summer because we've both had crazy summers. And um, we had bought a whole bunch of fleeces to split with her and my friend Diana at the Fleece and Fiber sale back in June, which is a local festival that happens here in the Lower Mainland just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia. And we bought seven fleeces and then we split them between the three of us. And Kelsey was kind enough to wash them for all of us, which was amazing. I'm going to get her some flowers or something. And um, she dropped them off the other day. And one of the fleeces is Clun Forest. And one of the other ones is Dorset. There's Cotswold. There's a Romney Cross. Anyways, if you guys are curious, I'll show them on, on the next podcast episode. Really fun. But yeah, Clun Forest would be a great one to do. So this, I'm really enjoying knitting this. I'm so glad that I knit this, that I, that I spun this fiber up in this past summer. I kind of lovingly refer to, like, think of this fiber as, like, the, the spin that kind of got me through everything with my dad. So, and also, I wanted to say, I've had a couple of really beautiful messages from people from our community and from our community at large, um, outside of just Patreon, but also our community at large, Instagram, like, people that are, like, Instagram friends and blog friends, and I just wanted to say thank you so much. I... It's a really amazing community, but when things happen in our lives and there's sadness and grief as well as things to celebrate, it's just, it's really, you guys are so amazing and kind. So thank you so much for your messages. Um, maybe next episode I'll like wear the dress. <laughs> All right. Okay. Clem Forest. I think that is awesome because if there, if you guys have requests for Braden Color Studies, like please tell us and tell me and Katrina because like we want to know if there's stuff that you guys want to learn about and want to do and fibers that you want to focus on like Shetland, Clem Forest. Tell us. We want to know. I shared this on the podcast last time. I It wasn't washed. It wasn't finished. The fringe wasn't finished yet either and it had just come off the loom. So I had done the hem stitching because I I had done that before I pulled it off the loom. I'm calling this, this is a bed skirt. That's officially what it is now. It's a bed, or no, no, a bed scarf. I Googled it. <laughs> Apparently that's what they're called. It ended up being way too long for anything else. I could cut it up and make like pillows or something, but I really don't want to. And I, I think if I was to do that, I would have planned that ahead of time. Um, so I hem stitched the bottom. It ended up finishing finishing this really nicely. Obviously the warp that I put on was a bit too long for what I had originally hoped for. What I wanted originally was like a stole. It was like something like this. But it's just too long. It's too big. I'm going to move the camera so you guys can really see it. And then I'll put the webcam back. We'll switch it back in just a sec. But this is, it's just too big to be a stole. It's pretty, don't get me wrong, it's gorgeous. But it's just a little bit too much fabric. So it ended up being, um, I put the finished measurements on the blog post, but it ended up being the fin finished, finished, finished. It ended up being 20, 22 inches wide, so this way, and got stuck on something. You can really see in the white, I think it's the white that you can really see, the 3.12. Um, so I'll put the webcam back on. We'll switch around again. Um, you can really see that in the, in the brown, you can't see the twill quite as, quite as clearly. Um, even on the other side, you can't see it quite as clearly, but in the white, you can really see it, which is really neat. So then your eye creates it. Let me figure out. I, um, you know, the problem with it, I, I probably could wear it. Number one, it's way too warm and it's just too big. Like if I've got the kids with me and stuff, I can't be like fiddling with something. I need to be able to just wear and go. So as soon as I put it on, I was like, oh no, that I, there's no way I can wear this. It's too hot for one. We just don't get cold weather here. Like we're lucky if we see minus two. Um, 
it's just too much. But yeah, it is long enough for a baby wearing wrap. So that's, that's kind of neat. Um, single blanket for a, a couch. It probably could. The problem is it's too narrow. So like I think if it was wider, you could use it as a blanket, but it's a bit too narrow. Like you'd kind of ended, end up with it like sort of like this and then your legs aren't covered at all. Um, it just needed to be a little bit wider to be like a blanket. But as a bed scarf, it's actually kind of perfect. There's been quite a few evenings this week where it cooled down quite a bit and we didn't, I didn't really want to be like under the covers, but I wanted something over my feet and I ended up tucking my feet under this and sleeping with it. And it was so nice and warm. And of course, if your feet are warm, it tricks your body into thinking that your body is warm. So, and it's really cozy. So it's 90 inches long by 21 and then the fringe is five and a half inches. So I cut the fringe originally to be seven inches and it shrunk up to five, five and a half. So um, some of it really worked well. Like the, the Shetland just looks amazing as fringe. And then other parts of it, like the Falkland, it because of it being a finer wool, it really kind of, it really fold. I think it actually might even be a little bit felted, but it looks great. The, uh, the Meat Merino Suffolk cross here, it really got a bit, a bit felted. So what I did to finish it, I actually finished it the way that Kelsey, my friend Kelsey finishes everything. She's Kelsey Tremblett on Instagram. Her Instagram feed is amazing. She's an incredible weaver. She, my compact that's in the back here that I just bought that I've talked about on other podcast episodes, I had bought it from a woman who also had a 60 inch back hinge, nihilus, low profile LeClaire for sale. And, um, it has a, it was a, had a one inch sectional beam on the back. She had all the accessories. Um, Kelsey and I figure it's probably worth like when she bought everything brand new, it probably was about a $10,000 loom, 60 inches wide. Anyways, Kelsey was able to get it. So I was so pleased cause it's her dream, her dream loom. And she's weaving on a 45 inch fanny counterbalance LeClaire loom right now. So, um, Anyways, I finished this the way that Kelsey finishes her stuff. So I put it into a warm water wash with some eucalyn, just left it to soak, let it, all the fibers fill up with water and, you know, do their, do their thing. And then I, um, um, used a towel and I just rolled it in a towel like I would a hand knit sweater. And then I put it in the dryer and I stood there and I timed it. I didn't walk away. I stood there and I timed it. So every two minutes I checked the dryer because we have a high efficiency dryer. We've got a brand new washer and dryer because they broke last year. I talked about it on the podcast. Um, cause I was, I bought my washer and dryer based on what I wanted for washing woolens, which the guy just thought I was crazy, but whatever. Um, our dryer doesn't get very hot. It takes a long time to get the heat up. So two or three minutes in our dryer, the, it, it's not warm yet. So this ended up going through four times for two minutes. And this is what I ended up with. Just beautifully fold fabric. I probably could have gone a bit longer, but I wouldn't, I don't think I would have wanted to because the Falkland really, it really fold. And so did the crossbreed. They really, they're really great felting fibers. Like um, I had a bit of a disaster with my lemongrass that was knit out of the the crossbreed. It had, it felted a bit in places when I washed that sweater after I spun and knit it. So I was very, very aware of not completely felting the fabric and ruining it. But I wanted to make sure that it was stable, that the fabric was stable, that the warp and weft was stable because it was woven quite open because I didn't have a ton of weft, which is probably not a good thing to do. Um, Cause I ran out by the end. Remember I talked about that on the podcast. Um, I wanted to make sure that it was a really stable fabric that you couldn't pull it apart and stick your finger through and stuff. And that's exactly what's happened. And that was what I was going for. So, but when you hold it up to the light, some light does go through, but you can't see through it. Um, the other thing that I wanted to share with you too is because this was a brand new loom that I was weaving on and I'd never woven on it before, I started off with a really hard beat at the beginning. 
So you can see how the 12, the 3.12 pattern is like really noticeable right at the beginning. And there's, it's a very balanced warp and weft and you can really see. And then I loosened it up to see what would happen. And then towards the end, I was probably actually weaving a bit too loose because right around here, which is about halfway, I started to realize that I was gonna run out of yarn. So here it's really clear and then it, you start to lose the patterning. Like I was just beating a bit too light. And even though I was measuring and making sure that everything was stable or was the same, I think I started pushing that measurement a bit more. And so toward the end of the blanket, it's a bit too open. And you lose, like in the, in the dark brown, you really lose the, the patterning. Even though, I mean, you can see it on the monitor. It's coming up more. It, the patterning actually comes up better on the computer screen than it does in real life. In real life, it's not as as obvious as it is on the monitor. So it's interesting. So a um, couple of things about that. First, it was a br I'd never used the loom before. It was a brand new kind of. It was just an experience, a learning experience for me. And does it affect the overall product? Not really. Would I be able to sell this in our artisan sale? Probably not. Um, I'm not sure I would want to put something like this out there for sale when I know that it's not woven evenly. Did I learn a lot? Absolutely. So, and, and it's still usable. We'll probably have it on our bed for years and years and years. Oh, yeah, you guys are talking about Brexit and stuff. Okay. Um, there are some changes coming down the pipeline. I just got the message yesterday from Patreon for our UK subscribers. So if you have... Uh, I can just really quickly talk about that so that you guys are aware when your stuff is processed. Um, and also, welcome to new we um, to some of the new patrons. I haven't sent you messages yet just because of the type of week that we've had. But um, you will be getting a message from me and you will be hearing from me. And if you're waiting for your Slack channel invite, I will be saying those out later today. Um, yeah, so the EU, um, a new EU law is going into effect this month that will require Patre Patreon to add an extra security step for EU patrons. So you may get pop-ups from their bank when pledging or updating payment methods that request a username and a password, a code sent to email or text or any other authentication method supported by their bank. So if you're if you guys have any questions about this, um, it's best to contact your bank directly, as Patreon does not control the form. But you can there's a there's an article and I can link it in the show notes if that would be helpful um, from their help center from Patreon's help center to help you to navigate this. So um, I'm not in the EU, but I know it will affect people in our Patreon community. So if you have any questions. Um, once it sort of starts to roll through, there is that article from Patreon that's there to help you. And then also you just need to talk to your bank. All right. Everybody is standing in front of me, my whole family, on the front porch staring at me, waving at me. So, um, oh, thank you, Eve. So um, she's offering to help San with her fiber. <laughs> that's amazing. How do you figure out how to have enough warp and weft? What are your favorite resources for beginners figuring that out? Trial and error. Okay, so yeah, so Kelly pops in and says, Felicia Lowe from Sweet Georgia talks about those calculations. It was on one of her Taking Back Friday episodes. That's absolutely right, Kelly. There's a spreadsheet that calculates warp and weft in the School of Sweet Georgia. Um, and, oh, please add the Patreon link. I will I will do that, uh, Eve. And, um, let me just get my thoughts straight. So here, Eve, this is for you. Um, oh, it won't let me paste it. I'll paste it in the Slack channel and I'll put it in on the show notes. It's too long. The link is way too long. Um, so warp and weft. So my friend Brenda said to me, uh, she owns one of our local yarn shops and she actually said to me, just figure out what you want for your warp. So if you're doing, let's say you're doing a, just to keep the numbers round, you wouldn't actually do this, but let's just say you're doing a 10 yard warp, which is way too long, 
you normally would do more like two or three yards if it's your first warp. But let's say if it's three yards, you're probably doing like a scarf or a stole. So let's say you're doing, okay, so let's say you're doing a two yard warp and you're doing it at 10 ends per inch. Basically you multiply two by 10 um, and that gives you your, um, how much yarn you're gonna need. And then Brenda basically doubles that. So whatever you need for your warp, you're gonna need for your weft. It's not actually that cut and dry because you have drawn on your loom. So you actually will use a little bit less when you're weaving your weft. You generally don't need as much weft because you don't have the waist at the top and the bottom of the loom because you're not weaving right till the end and you're not starting right at the beginning. So again, you don't need as much weft. But for to keep the numbers round when you're first starting, especially if you're on like a rigid heddle where they have very minimal waist, whatever you need for your warp, double it. That's what you're gonna need. You're gonna need that for your warp and that for your weft. So if you need 100 yards of yarn for your warp, you're gonna need 100 yards of yarn for your weft. It's just a very simple way to get started. It's not, it is more complicated than that. There are more complication. there are more calculations because you need 10% in lieu of waste and so on and so forth. And over time, we will talk about that on the podcast. Um, I do all of those calculations when I'm figuring out like stuff for tea towels or like I bought, I haven't showed you guys yet, but I bought some stuff, some two weight cotton for a piece of fabric that I wanna weave to do a woven shirt. When I do the, some of that stuff, I will share with you how I got my numbers. But basically, um, one of the things that I would do when I have my rigid heddle if I had one skein and it took one skein of like say 200 yards to warp the weft, the, the, the warp to make the warp on the, cause on a rigid heddle, you're often using a, um, what's it called when you're warping with just the, um, the post direct warping. When you're direct warping, let's say I used 200 yards of yarn. I would then make sure that I had 200 yards for the weft. With this project, I had so many scrap skeins that I had kind of thought without calculating yardage, which not a good idea, that I had, because I was just wanted to blast through a whole bunch of stash, I, I thought that I would have enough of the gray because I had so many skeins of gray. I had the Jacob, I had the Disdaro, uh Romney mohair gray, and I had another unlabeled gray. They were all slightly different weights, but they were all two ply and had all been spun semi woolen. And I just kind of thought I'll just weave until I run out. The problem with that though, is you kind of start to play like a mental game where it's like, well, I need to eke out more warp. So I'll just spread out my weft a bit more and I won't beat as hard. So then I end up with an uneven, like the beginning is definitely different than the end. So that was not the right thing to do. There is a lot of skill in learning how to beat consistently. And I have found the biggest challenge with switching to floor looms from a rigid heddle and then going to a table loom and then going to a floor loom. I think for me so far, the biggest learning curve has been the beating. Because on a big 45 inch floor loom, the beater is weighted. So it's heavy. <clears throat> and it's just, it's big pieces of wood, it's heavy. And on the compact, the beater is very solid and it comes forward like this on a hinge. I have it folded up just to get it out of the way because James and Mike have been um, playing games and stuff while Mike's been recovering. Um, so your beater is, is, is like this. It's coming forward like this. And there's a name for that type of beater and it's just escaping me right now. But on a, the table loom that I was working on and most table looms, they're hanging beaters and they swing from up here and they hang down. So you have a different motion because your beater is kind of going like this. And then on a rigid heddle, your beater is also your reed. So you're literally like pulling, popping it off of its, where it sits in the rigid heddle. You're popping it off, bringing it forward. It's just, it's not secured to anything you beat and then you push it back in and put it in the up position or the down position, whatever the next shed is. So 
all of those beaters are different. They all have different purposes. And on a floor loom, you can get a much firmer beat. And the bigger the loom and the heavier the loom, the firmer the beat you can get. So like, you know, the counterbalance Fanny 45 inch Leclerc is awesome for rugs, but you're probably not going to make a rug on a Louette Jane table loom because you can't get that really firm, hard beat. So what I'm saying is it's a huge learning curve and that's where working on the tea towels has been really great for me because I've been able to work on my salvages and I've been able to work on making sure that my beat is even because it's really easy to calculate your picks per inch as you're building your weft against your ends per inch because you've already warped it up and you've already set all of that. And for me, I've been doing my tea towels at 18 ends per inch and then 18 picks per inch. So there's... Um, 32 ends, is it 32 or 36 ends in that little one inch square? And you can check that and you can measure that and then you know if you've got an even beat or not. So it's just practice, it's practice, 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 practice. All right, can you weigh your loom warped up and figure out the actual loom weight and subtract it from the warped loom weight? Oh, that's an interesting question. Can you calculate weft if, for example, an impatient weaver did a direct warp without measuring the distance first? So actually, Eve, funny you would ask that because I do that all the time. Um, when I was still on my rigid heddle, I never did yardage. And like my friend Diana, she's so great. She always said, this is how much yardage I use. This is how much da 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 da. These are the pre-washing dimensions, the post-washing. I really appreciate all those things. And I never did any of that, um, which is maybe why I found it so frustrating. But I would find on average, if I did a 72 inch direct warp, which is about a two yard warp, I, if it was like with a, uh, my seven and a half dents per inch re, um, heddle on my rigid heddle, if it was my seven and a half, I would generally need about 200 yards of yarn and then I would use 200 for the, for the weft. Um, cause I made several scarves that were like that and they were about 10 inches wide, give or take. Um, so you can do it. You just have to accept that you might run out of weft. So yeah, so Charlotte's got a great point. Most weaving patterns tell you how many picks per inch you should beat to. So you kind of have a standard to start with. So the way that you calculate whether or not your picks per inch are correct is you literally get your ruler out and you sit there and you count your threads. So I would put my ruler on here and I would count one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on up to the inch. Um, and that's how you keep yourself consistent. So you really, you really have to, weaving is very technical in a way I'm finding personally that spinning and knitting is not. Um, I find the weaving, I remember having a conversation with a friend, my friend Kelsey, and we were talking about like when people first start weaving like on rigid heddles and whatnot, and I did this too, so I'm not criticizing, uh, you, you, you kind of just go for it, right? And you, um, you maybe change your plan halfway through or you start warping and then you add other yarns because you're kind of just being creative and you're just enjoying the process and it's not a big deal. The problem is that when you're on like a big floor loom and you've warped up like however many ends per inch for your warp and you've threaded all your heddles and now you've slayed your reed and you've tied on, you can't keep changing your mind. You have to have a plan. So you have to do the calculations. You've got to figure out your yardage. You've got to figure out your draw in. So that's how much from, from your warp, how much is going to draw in when you start weaving. You generally lose about 10%, but some people lose more, some people lose less. And you need to figure all that out. And you can't just change your mind halfway through. Um, it just doesn't work. And you end up with weaving disasters. But then you also have to learn and you have to practice. And you have to projects like this where you try different beats and you try different things and you sort of let it kind of be what it is. So, yeah. Um, you guys are chatting. I was thinking, yeah, you can't weigh a floor loom. That's true. We could talk about weaving forever because we all are so interested in it and um, I love it. I love talking about it. It is obviously um, one of my absolute most favorite things to talk about besides spinning. And um, 
You know, Diane, actually, I think you just summed it up. I think sometimes with this kind of stuff, when you're learning, ignorance really is bliss because you can just create and make and come what may. And in that you learn so much. So that's a great place to stop. Um, some people are not intimidated by their own ignorance and that could be a wonderful feeling. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And you know, it's funny because when I got my first rigid heddle, it was one of the bigger ones I talked about on the show when I got it way back. And uh, I think it was the 32 inch wide. And I wanted to make these big pieces of fabric and stuff. And I knew right away it wasn't, it the rigid heddle wasn't for me because I wanted to do some other stuff. But it was interesting because um, I had no idea what I was doing. And I just kind of started doing it. And I went over to my friend Diana's one day with my friend Jeanette, who I had borrowed the, the Jane from. And um, they, you know, that we worked her Diana's loom all up and show me how to hem stitch and do all the thing. And I, I just, I had no idea what they were doing. And I just stood and watched and listened, tried, tried, sorry, tried to take in as much as I could. And Bob's your uncle, you know, so. It's probably the same with any enormous project, spinning, knitting, or anything else. The larger it is and the more invested you are in a particular result, the more you want to plan. It's true. It's true. Um, all right. It might teach me some valuable life skills as I'm not a planning kind of person. Okay, so funny story, and then we'll say goodbye. A friend of mine said to me the other day, she's like, I, I was talking about something and we're trying to organize some stuff and, and I was telling her about it. This was family stuff and then I was relaying it to her. And she says to me, well, you know, you and I are planners though. Like, you know, sort of agreeing with me about what had happened and saying like, oh, that's really too bad. And I was like, actually, I'm not. I'm not a planner at all. I'm very organized. And so my husband and I, Mike and I, we had a whole conversation about it this week while he was re recovering because he was home and uh, about the fact that actually the weaving has been really good for me because um, I do have to plan a bit more and I have to be a bit more intentional and a bit more intentional about how I use my stash and whatnot. So, um, cause my mom's just giving me back four bins of yarn that she wants to get out of her house just in case she decides to put the house on the market. And, um, I thought I would actually do some blankets on the, um, compact, um, which is a whole bunch of my stashed yarn. So just match up all of my fingering weight, match up all of my sport weight, match up all of my DK weight. Again, not calculating yardage, just warping up, doing some three yard warps and uh, just reaming off a bunch of stuff and using up the yarn and just randomly doing the warps and then whatever I have left over I'll do as the weft and kind of weave until I run out. I thought it would be a great way to get used to this loom and uh, yeah, I'll keep you guys posted. All right, okay. Um, oh, thank you, Kelly. So actually it's so funny that you would say that, Kelly, because that was actually what I was just gonna segue into. So Kelly says, loving your new School of Sweet Georgia course, by the way. So that's my big, big news for today. Um, the School of Sweet Georgia, if you're a part of that community, uh, my my first of two courses have has been released. So Felicia released it on yesterday. It's called Spin to Knit a Sweater. And um, if you use my affiliate link, which I will put into the show notes, I will put into all the things. That's actually how I'm compensated for that work. So if you don't mind to... Um, using that link if you're not a member of the school yet um, I would really appreciate that a lot and because uh, then I'm compensated for my work as well and um, yeah it's called spin to knit a sweater it is out and thank you so much it's um I'm uh, yeah I'm really happy with how it turned out um, I feel like a total nerd sitting there talking and watching myself but um, it was really fun to make I really enjoyed working with Felicia on that she's one of my one of my close friends and it was really a lot of fun so I felt really honored to to be to have the opportunity to work with her and to do that and I'm really excited to, to for you guys to see the sock one because it's quite an advanced course and uh, again I'm, I'm I'm really proud of it so I will put those links down below and um I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend thank you so much for being here I need to go because uh, we have to uh, get um, all of our stuff organized for, for Mike's follow-up. And um, I hope you guys are doing lots of spinning, lots of knitting. And uh, until next time, have a, have a wonderful week. Bye, guys. Mm -hmm.